guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering a mixed group of questions. So these questions are gonna cover everything from first semester of the nursing school uh, program, fundamentals, farm, all the way to the end, which is NCLEX prep, preparing you to take that big exam for your licensure. Guys, if you haven't done so already, please be sure to like and subscribe below. Make sure you press that uh, notification button so that you can be notified every time a new video is released. So without any further ado, guys, let's get started. First question. The nurse on the medical surgical floor receives four new admissions. Which of the following clients should be placed in a private room? One, a client diagnosed with pneumocystitis carney pneumonia. Two, a client diagnosed with cellulitis of the left calf infected with group A strep. Three, a client diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Or four, a client diagnosed with cutaneous anthrax. If you're new to my channel, guys, just go ahead and uh, press that pause button if you need to. Look at the question, look at the choices, and whenever you're ready, just press play. So the correct answer, guys, is two. The client diagnosed with cellulitis of the left calf infected with group A strep. So this client is gonna have to be on contact precautions, okay, for at least until that first 24 hours that they've been on antibiotics. Now, remember, this is group A strep, so they're going to be on some type of antibiotic that's going to kill a gram-positive bacteria, right? But that patient has to be on those antibiotics for a full 24 hours before we take them off of contact precautions. Now, our other choices, one, three, five, the patient with uh, pneumonia, the patient with Guillain-Barre, the patient with anthrax, we're going to use standard precautions with those patients. Next question. The nurse cares for a client preparing for surgery. 30 minutes after administering the pre-op med medication, the nurse ob observes a nursing assistant ambulating the client to the bathroom. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? One, assist the client back to bed. Two, ask the nursing assistant if the client had difficulty walking. Three, determine why the nursing assistant ambulated the client. Four, ensure that the nursing assistant receives appropriate training. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay guys, so the correct answer is one, assist the client back to bed. Why? Think about it. It's pre-op medication, so a patient's gonna be what? Getting sedatives, they're gonna be sedated, okay? If that CNA or that nursing assistant ambulating that client down the hall or to go to the bathroom, that patient very well may what? Fall and injure themselves. So that is our priority, the patient safety. We're gonna get that patient back to bed. Um, let's look at the other choices. That's my question. Okay, so number two, ask the client, um, ask the nursing assistant if the client had difficulty walking. Well, of course they probably have difficulty walking. We just gave them medications that will sedate them, okay? So we already know why they had difficulty walking. Choice three and four, asking why they did it or getting that CNA training, we can worry about that later. But right now, our priority is patient safety and making sure that patient doesn't uh, fall or injure themselves. The nurse cares for a client with an internal radium implant. It is most important for the nurse to take which of the following actions? One, restrict visitors with upper respiratory infections. Two, assist, excuse me, assign the client to male caregivers. Three, plan nursing activities to decrease time spent in the client's room. Or four, wear a lead lined apron when caring for the client. And guys, the correct answer is three, plan nursing activities to decrease time spent in the client's room. Now, here's the thing. You want to make sure that 
um, your exposure is minimized, right? So you're not going to keep going in and out of the room and keep increasing your exposure to that radiation, right? So what you want to do is plan ahead. And this is what's called clustering. You're going to cluster your activities. So everything you have to do for that patient, you go in the room and you get it done. You don't keep going in and out. You want to decrease your exposure, um, to the radiation. Let's look at our other choices. One, restrict vi visitors with upper respiratory infections. We're restricting everybody, all visitors. Your time's going to be restricted with that patient. And not only are we restricting the time with the visitors because we don't want them exposed to radiation for that long, right? No children, no pregnant women. Okay, so that's why number one's wrong. Two, assign the client to male caregivers. The male caregivers are going to be exposed to radiation just like the female caregivers, okay? It doesn't make a difference, so that's not going to be your answer. Then you have four, wear a lead-lined apron when caring for the client. You don't need to do that for routine care. And in the question, they tell you that you're, um, you're just caring for this uh, client. You're not going to wear a lead-lined um, apron for routine care, but you do need to cluster your activities, plan ahead, go in that patient's room, do everything you got to do for them, and get out. All right, next question. After the nurse, excuse me, the nurse administers a tube feeding to a client with a baseline decreased mental status. Immediately after completing the tube feeding, it is most important for the nurse to place the client in which of the following positions? One, supine with the head of the bed elevated 45 degrees. Two, supine with the lower extremities elevated on pillows. Three, high fowlers or semi fowlers position. Or four, on the right side with the head of the bed elevated. And the correct answer is four, on the right side with the head of the bed elevated. Why? When you place that patient on their right side, you're promoting that um, the drainage, the gastric of that feeding that you gave to that patient. You're promoting for that food and that feeding to drain from the stomach to the large intestine, right? Because you're placing them on the right side. And at the same time, let me go back to it. So it says on the right side and the head elevated. So not only are you promoting drainage from the stomach to the small intestine, because the head of the bed is up, you're also preventing what? Aspiration. So that is the best choice. But very often on test questions, I won't see that as a choice. What they give you guys students, um, they'll give you choice one and two. And then the third one will say high fowlers. If you do not see right side, head elevated, your second best option is high fowler's position because the high fowler's position, it will um, help prevent aspiration, okay? During a flood, two ambulances arrive to the emergency substation at the same time. One contains a two-year-old near-drowning victim on a ventilator. The other contains an 80-year-old client with a left-sided CVA who is conscious and has a blood pressure of 220 over 130. Which patient should the nurse see initially? One, two-year-old because she's on a ventilator. Two, 80-year-old because he's hypo hypertensive. Three, two-year-old because she's victim of a flooding. Or four, an 80-year-old because he's older. So whenever you see these questions asking you, who are you going to see first? That's another way of saying which patient is the most unstable. And in this situation, it's obvious. The most unstable patient in this situation is our 80-year-old. Look at that blood pressure. 220 over 130. Guess what? That is a hypertensive crisis, okay? This patient might go ahead and do what? Have another stroke on us, okay? So we need to address that and get that patient's blood pressure down immediately. Yes, we care about that two-year-old on the vent, but guess what? They're on the vent. They're getting oxygen in their body. There's nothing that tells us right now acutely there's something going on with them that we need to get to them before that um, hypertensive crisis, okay? So that patient with that elevated blood pressure, that's who we need to address first. The nurse cares for a client diagnosed with croup. 
the nurse should follow which of the following transmission-based precautions? One, standard precaution. Two, airborne precaution. Three, droplet precaution. Or four, contact precaution. Okay, guys, so the correct answers for contact precautions, crew, that's that viral infection that we see in peds. The little kids get it. We see in peds and they have that barking cough, okay? We're going to put that patient on contact precautions. Let's look at our other choices. Choice one, standard precaution. Guys, we use standard precautions for everybody, right? We want to make sure that we don't give that patient infection while they're in the facility. What's that called? Nosocomial infection. We want to make sure we don't give that to the patient. So everybody, we do standard precaution, okay? Two, airborne precaution. Airborne, that's for the patients who have like um, tuberculosis, measles, chicken pox. Those are the type of patients we put on airborne precautions. Three, droplet precautions. Those are the patients such as um, pertussis, influenza, the flu, pneumonia, all right? But the patient with crew, that's somebody we put on contact precautions. The nurse cares for a client diagnosed with hepatitis A. The client complains of fatigue, anorexia, and intolerance to odors. It is most important for the nurse to recommend which of the following. One, eat small frequent feedings. Two, restrict the amount of protein that you eat. Three, decrease your caloric intake to 1400 calories per day. Or four, limit your alcohol intake to three ounces of wine per day. And the correct answer is one, eat small frequent feedings. Why? Well, if you go back to the question, you see that they have hepatitis A. And what do they have? Anorexia, right? So they're not eating. They have fatigue. Guess what? The act of eating is tiresome. The act of eating takes oxygen away from the patient. They're eating, right? And it's very tiresome. This patient already has fatigue. So we don't want them eating big, large meals that make them even more tired, right? We want them to eat um, small but frequent meals so they can keep their energy while they're getting the nutritious foods that they need to get into their body. We also want them to have healthy snacks in between. Let's look at our other choices so I can explain to you why they're wrong. You have choice two, restrict the amount of protein that you eat. Excuse me? Um, protein, vitamin C, calories are needed for healing, right? So this patient who is anorexic is not eating. They need that protein. That protein helps with healing. Choice three, decrease your caloric intake. Uh-uh, they need the energy to heal. They need they need that those calories. So we're not going to decrease the calories. We're going to increase the calories because they need those calories. Those calories give them energy for healing. And then choice four. Stop it. Stop it right now. Hepatitis A, which primarily affects what? Your liver. And you're going to tell them to limit their alcohol? No. They need to cease that alcohol. Stop it. Cut it out. They can't even touch alcohol until a solid six months after uh, treatment that they're, they're, they don't have um, chronic hepatitis, okay? So they need to stay away from alcohol 100%, not decrease consumption, cessation, complete cessation of alcohol. So that's why number one is your correct answer. The nurse in the outpatient clinic counsels a client diagnosed with genital herpes. The client states, I don't know how I keep getting reinfected because I'm really careful. Which of the following responses by the nurse is best? One, what do you mean I am really careful? Two, the virus remains in your body in a dormant state. Three, are you sure that you protect yourself adequately? Four, have you notified all of your sexual contacts? 
And the correct answer is two, the virus remains dormant in your body. So what happens is once you're infected with that herpes virus, it doesn't go away. So it can go up, be dormant where it's not active, the patient doesn't have any lesions, but then something can trigger it to become active, such as stress, right? And when I say stress, I'm not only speaking psychologically, physically as well. If a patient gets sick, that's a stress on the body, right? And for females, just the fact that they start menstruation, that can be a stress on the body. So something will trigger it and it becomes active again. And that's when the patient will have the lesion. So it never goes away. It just goes into a dormant state where it's it's sleeping, right? And the patient doesn't see any lesions and then it can go active again. So something very important to teach these patients when um, that herpes is active, when those lesions are pre present, they need to abstain from sexual activity. A tornado has just uh, leveled a large housing division near the hospital and the disaster alarm has been announced at the hospital. The nurse caring for clients on the postpartum pediatric unit considers which of the following clients most appropriate for discharge within the next hour. One, the postpartum who delivered over an intact perineum 12 hours ago. Two, postpartum client diagnosed with infection that's been receiving antibiotics for the past 24 hours. Three, three-year-old newly diagnosed with diabetes type 1, diarrhea and vomiting, or four, a three-year-old, excuse me, a three-day-old breastfeeding infant with a totem serum bilirubin of 14. So guys, the correct answer is four. When you see a question say, which patient would you choose for discharge or which patient is most likely to be discharged? What they're really asking you is who is the most stable patient? And out of these four choices, that three day old with the 14 Billy Rubin that's breastfeeding, they're most stable. Why? It's been three days, right? So, and the Billy Rubin is 14. Guess what? We don't even consider phototherapy until a patient's bilirubin is more than 15. This patient's is only 14. And they're breastfeeding. You want to know what the breastfeeding does? It promotes excretion. Okay? Through what? Their stool. So guess what? That bilirubin is going to get even lower. So that patient is most stable out of the whole list here. Let me tell you who is second in line right? The most sec the second most stable patient. That's your number one. The patient who gave um, birth 12 hours ago with an intact perineum. What, why does, um, why is that important for us to know that their perineum's intact? Well, the chance of them bleeding is uh, decreased, right? We're really not worried about them um, bleeding. There's nothing in this that tells us that the patient's hemorrhaging. They're not talking, saying anything about a soft or boggy uterus. They're not saying anything about um, patient squirting blood, nothing. All it says is that they delivered 12 hours ago with the intact perineum, okay? Two and three are least stable. Look at two. The client with an infection and taking antibiotics for the past 24 hours. We don't know what those WBCs are. We don't know if those WBCs were at 30, and now that they have antibiotics, they're down to 25. Well, guess what? They still have a severe infection because your WBCs are supposed to be 5 to 10, okay? So that patient's not stable. We don't know where that patient is. And choice three, the three-year-old with newly, that's your first hint that that patient's not stable because they have something new that's going on with them, okay? That's your first hint. They're, um, where is it? Newly diagnosed diabetes type 1. On top of that, diarrhea and vomiting. That is the least stable patient. Okay? So out of this choice, um, the most stable is the three-year-old, the three-day-old that's breastfeeding. The second most stable is intact perineum 12 hours ago. Third most stable, I don't even want to give third and fourth because those, those two are just really bad. They're going to have to stay. They're not going anywhere. 
All right, guys, next question. The public health nurse assesses a patient who's complaining of persistent cough with blood tinge sputum and night sweats. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? One, assess the patient's vital sign, signs, including the O2 sap. Two, place the patient on two liters of oxygen via nasal cannula. Three, assist the patient in putting on a mask. Or four, assess the patient's lung sounds. So the correct answer is three. On the video I did just last week, I talked to you guys about the triage, the famous triage for TB, and it's right here. Not only cough, it doesn't just say cough, it says what? Persistent, persistent cough, blood tinge sputum, and night sweats. The minute you see those three together, your mind needs to immediately go to tuberculosis. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do, put a mask on the patient. Why? You need to prevent the spread of that infection. Remember, tuberculosis is uh, a public health crisis, right? Because this thing is spread so easily that um, the patient could go on the bus, they could go on the subway, they could go on a train, anywhere. They cough and those little droplets stay suspended in the air for hours. And anybody that walks into that place where the patient coughs, where those droplets are suspended, they breathe it in, they can get infected, okay? And we take this so seriously that the government in the United States of America, it doesn't matter which state you're in, if a patient has tuberculosis and it's suspected that they're non-compliant with their medications, the government pays a nurse to go out to the patient's home and watch them take their medication. Why? because it's a public health crisis. Other diseases such as, you know, hypertension, cholesterol. I mean, we don't want you to die, but if you don't take your medications and you die, well, you only killed yourself, right? But with TB, you don't take your medications, you're killing yourself and everybody around you that's breathing in those droplets, okay? So that's why number three is the correct answer. Hospital administration decides the psychiatric unit will move to a former medical surgical unit in two months. The psych nurse manager goes to the new unit to assess its structure. Which of the following most concerns the nurse? One, the lights and floor coverings in the hallway. Two, the location of the nursing station in relationship to the patient rooms. Three, the fixtures, fixtures in the bathroom in patient rooms. Or four, the availability of a large central room for unit meetings and socialization. So guys, the correct answer is three, the fixtures in the bathroom in patient room, okay? This is a problem because remember, this was, you know, normally this is a normal med surge floor. So you have the safety rails, you have the towel bar or towel rail or rack, right? But when it comes to these psych patients, guess what? They can hang themselves from those bars or those rails, right? So patient safety is going to be a priority. Those things have to be collapsible with any type of pressure. So a little towel rack, if you put any type of pressure, it should collapse, why? So that patient can't hang themselves from it. The safety bar, you put any type of uh, a pressure on it, it should be able to collapse in a way that the patient will be safe, but the patient cannot hang themselves, okay? Patient safety is number one, so that's going to be that nurse's concern. A mother of a seven-year-old girl and a two-and-a-half-year-old boy tells a clinic nurse that she works full-time, loves to garden in her spare time, and has lots of house plants. She relates to the nurse that her two and a half year old is into everything all the time and drives me to distraction. Which of the following responses by the nurse is best? One, what kind of plants do you have? Two, who is available to care for your son when you need a break? Three, was your daughter like this when she was his age? Four, it must be hard balancing work and children. And the correct answer is one. What kind of plants do you have? So 
So guys, two and a half years old, what stage is this child in? In the toddler stage, right? Where they're running around and they're exploring. They're learning about their environment right? They even try to climb things. So she's getting into everything. We need to know what kind of plants mom has because what if she has a plant that's poisonous? And what do toddlers like to do? They look and then they do what? Put it in their mouths. Okay. Remember with the uh, toddlers, poisoning is um, a real concern. So we asked mom, what kind of plants do you have? And from there, we know what kind of teaching we have to do with mom in regards to the plants that she keeps in the home. The other choices, two, three, and four, we don't care. We do not care. What we care about is patient safety, all right? We want to make sure that child does not get poisoned, that child does not get harmed. So we need to know what kind of plants she has in the home. The nurse selects the z track method to administer hydroxyzine visceral for which of the following reasons? One, z track slows the rate of absorption. Two, z track is the safest and least painful way to give the injection. Three, the injection is irritating to the sub-Q and skin tissues. Four, z track prevents the medication from seeping into the venous circulation. And the correct answer is three, the medication is irritating to sub-Q and skin tissues. That is the correct answer. And something else the C-Track method does, um, does it keep the medicine from seeping into the vessels, but it keeps um, the medication sealed into that sub-Q area, that sub-Q tissue. Guess what's another medication that's very irritating as well? And we use the Z-Track method because it keeps that medication, that sub-Q area, and keeps it from seeping out iron, right? The physician prescribed. The physician prescribes ampicillin 125 milligrams IM every 6 hours for a 76-year-old woman. The injection site selected by the nurse should depend on which of the following. 1. The size of the muscle mass. 2. The total number of injections ordered. Three, the position of the patient in bed, or four, the gauge of the needle. So guys, the correct answer is the size of the muscle mass. This is a 76 year old woman and usually patients who are in the geriatric population, not usually, but very often they can be very thin, very frail. Well, we need to give this in the muscle and we need to make sure that we don't hit any vessels or um, any nerves because we don't want to give them neurovascular damage. So we need to make sure that um, where we're giving uh, the injection that the patient has a lot of muscle, a lot of muscle mass because we want to avoid nerves and blood vessels. So that's why number one is the correct answer. Wow, we're already down to our last question. Okay, guys, last question. The nurse cares for a teenager admitted for burns to 50% of her body. Which of the following actions by the nurse has the highest priority? One, counsel patient regarding body image changes. Two, maintain airborne precautions. Three, maintain aseptic technique during procedures. Four, encourage the teen's friends to visit regularly. Okay, guys, so there's only one answer to this question. Priority is always going to be, guys, what keeps the patient alive? What helps the physiological integrity, right? Blood pressure, fluid electrolytes, uh, nutrition, uh, glucose. What is physically keeping that patient alive, right? And in this situation, it's three, okay? We need to maintain, we need to make sure that we maintain sterility for that patient at all times. Why? My video that I did on integrity, when I talked to you about burns, what did I tell you was the three biggest concerns? Whenever you get a question and it's about burns, these need to be the first three things coming to your mind because these are three biggest concerns you're going to have as a nurse. Number one, infection. 
That's why you need to maintain sterility in everything you do for that patient. That patient cannot afford to get infection. Patients who go through burns are at risk for infection. Number two, shock because of that huge fluid shift, right? Now, even though that patient may look swollen, it's because of the fluid shift. All the fluid that's supposed to be in the vessels have now seeped out into the tissues. So guess what? If there's no um, blood, there's no fluid in the vessels, your, the patient's organs is not being perfused and the patient can go through what? Shock. Number three, pain. Now, as I said a million times, pain never killed anyone except in about four situations that we have to actually make pain a priority because it, it um, disrupts the patient's physiological integrity. What is that? Burns, sickle cell, stones, and I don't care what kind of stones, calcium, struvite, whatever. If it's st stone, we have to address pain. That's a priority. Myocardial infarction. We have to decrease the demand on the heart. And so morphine is very important for a patient that's had an MI, okay? But aside from those situ four situations, pain never killed anybody. It's not going to be a priority except in those four. And remember, burns is one of them, right? So anyway, that's why number three is the correct answer. We want to prevent that patient from getting infection. We're also going to be concerned about uh, pain and uh, infection, pain, what's my third one? Ah, shock, right? Um, dehydration, fluid volume deficit because of that huge fluid shift. So guys, I hope you guys uh, like the questions. I hope you um, like um, my explanation. If you guys would like to see more videos, please be sure to like and subscribe below. Make sure that you press that notification button so that you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Please help me help support this channel. How can you help support this channel? Share my videos, share them with classmates, share them with friends, anyone that you know studying for boards. Thank you so much for spending this time with me and I'll see you next time.